So next I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Thompson. He's the professor and the head of the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at the University of Calgary. He's also the chair of the Division of Physics Education at the Canadian Association of Physicists, as well as the secretary treasurer of the Division of Atomic and Molecular Physics and Photon Interactions at the Canadian Association of Physicists. In 2007, he was awarded the CAP Medal for Excellence in Teaching, which is the preeminent award in Canada for post-secondary educators in physics. Dr. Th Thompson has also published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and has received many prestigious grants. So thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you um, about some uh, topics in physics that are of uh, particular interest to me and uh, thank you all for, for coming out to, uh, to this event. Um, my uh, presentation is going to be slightly different than the two that preceded in that the way I what I've been asked to talk about is, is some work that Calgarians are currently doing at CERN, which is so, so uh, relevant to Dr. Salam's work over his career. And so rather than uh, further review of Dr. Salam's career, the theme that I'm trying to build here is more work that we're doing in the footsteps of Dr. Salam, work that um, in many respects was enabled by what he did during his career. So what, what we're focusing on today is um, the topic of antimatter and work that uh, uh, a large international group of us are involved in in trying to unlock the, se the secrets of antimatter. So my intention uh, in the next 25 minutes or so is to uh, connect for you or draw the line for you how this antimatter works. Uh, connects to the, 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 the uh, impressive accomplishments of Professor Salam. Then talk a little bit uh, to you about what antimatter is, because this is a topic that some people see in fiction, um, but uh, I'm not sure many people know a lot about. Then I think it would be interesting to talk to you a little bit about this international group of people that's involved in this work, um, and with the last little bit, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've accomplished. So, just a few opening comments. When you look at um, the record of Professor Salam, you're, you're simply struck by the uh, extent of what he did and what he accomplished over his career. Now, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity that that Barry had to, to, to meet the individual. But as you read about and look at what he's done, it's surprising how many different ways it influences where we are now. Now, dividing it up into a couple areas, I'm not going to go into detail on any of this, but we can look at a wide range of different things that he developed around, the, around um, his scientific work, his scientific areas of study. And that's just a short, uh, a partial list of everything he accomplished. Or alternatively, you can look at the various uh, initiatives he undertook as service to the, to the scientific community. And if I could bring together some unifying themes that these lists give us, is first, he spent his career testing the very foundations and exploring the very foundations of physics. And second, on the service side, he put tremendous effort into, into internationalizing physics, internationalizing science. And fundamentally, these are two things that, that those of us working on these uh, antimatter projects are continuing, are following in his footsteps. We really are trying to probe the very foundations and try to better understand the very foundations of physics, and that's the very foundations of science. But also, the scope of this type of work is such that individuals can't do it. And it's a matter, can't, can't achieve it on their own. And it's a matter of bringing together large international teams to bring all the expertise that's needed to accomplish some of the things that we have. So if I could just take a couple minutes and talk about my view of science and the roles of 
uh, both theory and experiment. So one fundamental difference between what I do and what Professor Salam did was that I'm what's called an experimentalist. I go into the lab and poke things with sticks and, 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 and try to measure things directly. And he was, his area was, was in terms of thinking big picture. But the, the theorists and the experimentalists are, are truly dependent on each other. If I'm going out and making measurements, I need some way to guide me. And if a theorist is going out and, and, and thinking about the larger concepts, developing postulates and hypotheses, he needs information to feed back, to tell him which way, which paths are the best to follow, which of which are the rivers you should take. So it's a constant cycle of the theorists coming up with ideas and giving the experimentalists directions to go and the experimentalists getting results and feeding back. So this is what I refer to as personally view as the heartbeat of physics. I got into physics, I love being in physics because it's a living, breathing field. And this cycle has been going on for centuries and continues to go on. And it's, it's the fact that things evolve in my field, that things grow, that things change, that our understandings change that really gives me passion to, to pursue the areas that I'm involved in in physics. So just for example, if you go back to the 19th century to the 1800s, people thought the foundations of physics was, were classical physics, classical mechanics, classical electrodynamics. But then experimentalists started doing measurements and started finding things that weren't explained by the classical theories. And they fed the information back and the theorists came back and said, oh, Classical physics isn't enough, but it isn't wrong, it's just incomplete. And in the 20th century, we got the quantum physics that's leading some to, to so much of the, the fascinating results of uh, work that people like Professor Sanders does. And as we continue to evolve and as we continue to look deeper and deeper experimentally and the theorists continued to think, uh, to develop further and further insight into, into what we were seeing, you, you continually expand our knowledge base of the foundations of physics. It's not that things were wrong, it's that we had incomplete views of things. So where we are sitting now foundationally is what's called the standard model of physics and the various symmetries that has been talked about earlier around it, the, 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 the highest level of symmetry we're dealing with right now is CPT symmetry. And so if for hundreds of years we keep asking this question, is our understanding of, of the foundations of physics complete, We're, we in our studies of antimatter are, doing, are asking that question about what is currently accepted as the, the, the foundation, and that is standard model and CPT, and asking the question, is it complete? So how are we doing that? What are we looking at? So you've already heard this a couple times, you'll get my version of it now. Um, we're all made up of building blocks. And the traditional version that you see in high school is typically the building blocks is the atoms. And then we put atoms together into, into, into molecules and build molecules together to build slightly larger things, uh, viruses, golf balls, the earth. But when you're looking for the foundations of science, you, you tend to um, go in the other direction. And instead of building things up, we probe down smaller and smaller. And, as, as Dr. Oyed talked about, and actually Dr. Sanders, you look at this building block of the atom, it's not actually the foundational building block. The atom is made up of a nucleus and electrons. Once you go into the nucleus, you find protons. Once you go into the protons, you find quarks and so on. So in understanding the foundations, we need to understand these, these foundational particles. And for example, are they truly foundational? So here's the same sets of fundamental particles that were talked about earlier. Now, in doing antimatter, I want to take us in a different direction. Each of these fundamental particles comes with an antimatter pair. And coming back to, this, to the symmetry discussion that we've been hearing earlier, in a simplified or perhaps oversimplified view, you could look at the antiparticle pair of each of these fundamental particles as the mirror image. So what is an antiparticle? 
If you take any one of the particles out there, the antiparticle has exactly the same, well, to the best of our ability to measure or theorize at this point, exactly the same mass, the exactly the opposite charge, so that's the characteristic that allows interaction with the electromagnetic forces we talked about earlier. And various other, uh, what we call quantum numbers, are also the exact opposite. And when you bring them, the two together, they annihilate and disappear and just create a, uh, a vast amount of energy. The evolution of the understanding of the existence of antimatter dates back um, uh, approximately a century. So if we go back to the early 20th century, this is the point where we were doing the transition from classical physics to quantum physics, and to relativistic physics actually. Uh, Albert Einstein came up with, um, from relativity with this relationship between mass and energy. When the, when we combine, and sorry, relativity deals with the physics of the very fast. Quantum mechanics, which I already mentioned, deals with the physics of the very small. In unifying things, we can unify the two of them to deal with very small things that are very fast. And when you bring them together, that's, you get relativistic quantum mechanics. And it turned out that in unifying these two um, theories, when dealing with one theory in isolation, you got one solution to the problem. When unifying together, you got two solutions. And when first unified, people thought, oh, that's the real solution, and the other mathematical solution is just, oh, it's just a mathematical artifact, it's not real. But it turned out that that other solution is this mirror-imaged um, antimatter. So once again, theorists started coming up with it and then experimentalists went out and started looking. And in 1932, looking at cosmic rays, physicists first spotted an anti-electron. Same mass as the electron, just the opposite charge. And that's coming in in the cosmic rays that are bombarding the Earth constantly. The proton is thousands of times heavier than the electron. And remember, Einstein said mass and energy are interchangeable, so it takes thousands of times more energy to make an antiproton than a proton, or than, an, than a positron. So it was another couple decades before antiprotons were observed, and those had to be manufactured in the, in the lab in the, uh, at, at Berkeley in California. So by the by the middle of the 20th century, people had observed these fundamental particles and confirmed that fundamental antimatter particles existed. The next step was to start to use those as the building blocks of the antimatter universe. So for people that have gone through high school chemistry, high school physics, they've seen this thing. It's the periodic table of the elements. Take protons, take neutrons, take electrons, put them together, build all the, the atoms that we build everything around us out of. The most fundamental, the simplest of this is the hydrogen atom. It's made up of one proton and one electron. Our goal is to take the positrons and take, it is to make, manufacture positrons, manufacture antiprotons, put them together and start to study the antimatter version of the periodic table, the antiperiodic table. So one antiproton and one positron bound together would give you a, uh, an antihydrogen or, or the simplest atomic antimatter. We're not alone in pursuing these questions. The, there are many different uh, collaborations, these ones are all at CERN, involved in this. The one we're involved in is called Alpha. Um, and we've had significant success in pursuing 
uh, the manufacture and study of atomic antimatter. Okay, so why study antimatter? I mentioned earlier the very foundations of physics right now, at least of particle physics right now, is the combination of the standard model with what's called CPT symmetry. And these, these symmetry questions are something that was absolutely uh, foundational to the work of Professor Salam. The problem that we find when we work with, with CPT symmetry is a fundamental contradiction. CPT symmetry says every time I make an antimatter particle, I should make a matter particle. Or vice versa, every time I make a particle of matter, I should make a particle of antimatter. So if CPT symmetry holds, then the world around us should be as much matter, or the universe around us should be as much matter as antimatter. But we have a problem. Remember, when matter meets antimatter, it annihilates. So if I'm matter and that table is antimatter, if I touch it, it will be rather spectacular. Trust me, I've done this test many times. I haven't failed it yet. Good. Table's made out of matter. So if CPT symmetry holds, we have this real problem. It says every time I made matter, I made antimatter. There should be as much antimatter out there as matter, but where is the antimatter? So we're testing these fundamental symmetries, and either we're going to get the answer that maybe they're not fundamental symmetries, maybe that symmetry is broken, maybe there is more matter than antimatter. Or maybe we can go out there and find the antimatter and it's just hiding. So, why study antimatter? Where is it? Why don't we have lots of it around? Why are we made out of matter as opposed to being made out of antimatter? Does anti, how does matter and antimatter interact? New, going as far back as Newton, which is now four centuries plus, if I have an apple and I drop it, it will fall to the earth. Matter likes other matter. They gravitationally attract each other. If I took an anti-apple, holding it might be a bit spectacular, but I'll figure out I can, I can do that, and I drop it on Earth, what will it do? Interestingly, CPT symmetry is completely silent on that question. You have to go to something called the weak equivalence principle, which is basically the theorists waving their hands a lot saying, we really believe this is what will happen. But does, do matter and antimatter attract each other? We're interested in asking that question. Really fundamentally to CPT, does matter and antimatter look exactly alike? CPT says it must. The light absorbed and the light admitted by ma a matter atom and an antimatter atom should be identical. And all of these questions interrelate with each other. Because if we start to find differences between the two, well, that satisfies potentially why we might have more matter than antimatter. But if we find differences, it may also give us ways to remotely identify antimatter. And then, of course, the interesting question is always, what can we do with it? For those of you that don't realize that antimatter is already being used in the world around us. If you've ever had a PET scan, it's a medical diagnostic scan. That's positron emission tomography. It's based on positrons. It's based on antimatter. It's being used in hospitals all around the world now. There's a group at CERN that's actually looking, it works in the same space we do, that's actually looking at using antimatter for cancer therapies. Not, not in the hospitals yet, but people are investigating it. Okay. I've waved my hands enough. Real reason we want to make antimatter for anybody who's ever read science fiction or watched a Star Trek movie is to power our starships. Uh, problem is, we can make antimatter now. We can make atomic antihydrogen. Um, it would take us two or three thousand years to make enough antimatter to, to heat your coffee this morning. So the rate we're making it right now 
uh, we're going to be waiting along for our waiting a while for our starships. So, quick summary on the historical side here. If you go back to the early uh, 1900s, the first theory, theory of antimatter arrived by the middle of the century. Uh, we were looking; we were de we, we could detect it or make it in the lab. But to study it. All of these detections of antimatter, the antimatter is moving incredibly fast. It's moving relativistically fast. We need to be able to start manipulating it and to start holding it, storing it. So that's where, where we come in, the alpha collaboration. So alpha stands for anti-hydrogen laser physics apparatus. Goal of alpha is to catch, store, or to make, store, and study anti-hydrogen. We're a group of about 40 scientists, 40 to 50 scientists. And the little red dots you see there are the home institutions for those 40 or 50 scientists, about 15 institutions that come together. About a third of it is Canadian. And up to about 10% of it is uh, University of Calgary folks. So there's a photo of the, we've tested all matter uh, human beings that are involved in the project. Uh, and there's some of the Calgary folks. Here's where we do it. That's our, that's our lab. Um, you've heard it mentioned a couple times. I'll come back to it again in a second. This is our lab. It's outside Geneva, Switzerland at the CERN Particle Physics Lab. Um, this photo is actually out of date. To my eyes, that's an incredibly oversimplified apparatus. If you, if, when we take the same photo, you can't even see the floor anymore. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to explain the entire apparatus to you. Here's the simplified version of the apparatus. It's complicated enough. It's made up of a device to catch antiprotons and a device to catch positrons, a technique to bring them together, make antihydrogen, catch antihydrogen. Simplified. So here's the requirements for it, for the apparatus. Um, and here's my list of the challenges of doing this experiment. So now if I flip between those two slides again, Here's the challenges, and here's the apparatus. One of the interesting things about getting into this field is pretty well everything we wanted to do when we started, nobody done before. So many people uh, questioned our sanity. Uh, we did ourselves from time to time. But uh, we've made a lot of progress on these things. So as I said, we need, a device, we need to catch the positrons, we need to make positrons, make antiprotons, we need to catch them, we need to bring them together, we need to make the antihydrogen, we need to catch the antihydrogen, we need to detect it. So, I need to collect positrons and antiprotons. Positrons are quite easy, they're the light guys, you can actually go to a company and buy a source for the positrons. Um, the, the source uh, for the positrons is over here on the right side. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's basically simply a piece of radioactive material that gives off positrons constantly. We coat it in lead and just collect the positrons as they come out. The antiprotons are the challenge. Uh, making them and making them cold is the difficulty. So you make antiprotons by taking two protons, one of them moving really fast, crash it into another proton, and remember what I said, CPT says every time I make a matter particle, I'll make an antimatter particle. So when I crash the two together with enough energy, I'll make another proton, so a third proton, and make an antiproton. I need a lot of energy to do that. I need a particle accelerator. I need a really big particle accelerator. The best place to go for really big particle accelerators is CERN. CERN is, a, is the French acronym for the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It's located on the French-Swiss border. Um, interestingly, when I'm at CERN, I sleep in, uh, in Switzerland, eat lunch in France. My office is right on the French border and my lab's in Switzerland. <laughs> So this is a big overview. Many, um, Dr. Oyed mentioned the, um, the work with the Large Hadron Collider to find the Higgs boson. That red loop there is the Large Hadron Collider. Um, 
It takes particles, moves them really, really fast, and they zip back and forth between France and Switzerland even faster than I do when I'm working there. The, the small circle just on the lower right is where the CERN main site is. We don't use the big accelerator ring. We use the smaller accelerators that feed the big ring for our experiment. And that's where we do our work. When you collide the high energy proton with another proton, make a, a third proton and then, a, and then an antiproton, because they're oppositely charged, they're easy to separate, but they're moving really, really fast. They're moving relativistically. So we need another device, which is called the antiproton decelerator, which is a particle accelerator, only I slam it in reverse. So instead of taking particles and speeding and speeding and making them faster and faster and faster, we make them slower and slower and slower to the point where we can catch them. So that's a photo of the um, antiproton decelerator facility. And the big photo here is the zone before we started to build the apparatus. Now, I have to do this work at CERN. CERN actually is big enough, it has its own hotel. So when I'm at CERN, I live in the hotel here that's shown in the red circle. There's three hotel buildings. Well, CERN calls it a hotel. Everybody who works there calls it a hostel. So it's not exactly a high-end accommodation. Interestingly, my office and lab at CERN are those yellow circles. It's sort of the other side. It's about a 15-minute walk. Now, when I do that walk each way, at least twice, more likely four times a day, I have to follow that route, the yellow route shown there. Um, I never really paid that close, close of attention to the roads that I follow. I just know turn left, turn right. Um, when I started looking it up, I discovered I walk on Rue Feynman, Rue Rutherford, um, Rue Curie. I also discovered, I come out of the hotel, I turn left, I walk to the end of that road and I turn left again onto the circled road there. And that road is Rue Abdul Salam. So I, I walk that road, I would say at least 50 times a year, and I'd never connected it to the man that we're talking about today. So thank you for the opportunity to make that connection. So we go to CERN and we get our antiprotons, and we make our positrons there. Oops. I need to make everything, or we need to make everything very, very cold. Because although we can catch antimatter, it's a very challenging thing to do. And remember, whenever antimatter hits matter, it will annihilate. So I have to do it without an object. I have to do it with, well, the quote, Star Trek, confinement fields. But they're not very strong. So we have to make everything very, very cold. When I say very, very cold, I don't mean Calgary cold. I don't even mean Edmonton cold. I mean over 270 degrees below zero. Interestingly, to achieve that, we do something called evaporative cooling. And every one of you, I'm guessing, uses evaporative cooling at least once a day. Because evaporative cooling is how your cup of coffee or tea cools every morning. If you take your cup and you put a lid on it, it will stay hot much longer. If you take the lid off, what is happening is the hottest water particles in there are escaping. They have enough energy to break the surface tension and get out of the cup. Because they're the hottest ones, they take a disproportionate amount of energy. And what's left is a colder sample. It's got lower energy. We do the same thing with the positrons and the antiprotons. Boil off the hottest, everything left behind gets colder and colder. And yes, we can go down to minus 270 using that technique. I doubt you do that with your coffee, but um, we can make things very, very cold. The next big challenge is, I've now got cold antiprotons and cold positrons. I have to mix them together, but I have to do it very, very carefully. Because if I just hit it with a sledgehammer, it gets hot again and, destroy, and destroys my effort to make things colder. 
So we do something, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I don't have the time to go into the detail, but we auto resonantly, we very carefully, with a very specific selected field, coherently push these particles together so they can interact with each other while staying cold. So this is a little diagram, I don't have time to go into the details, but the antiprotons are the little green guys up in the corner, the blue guys are the positrons. Positrons are easier to make, so we have a lot more of them, and we push the antiprotons into the positron. When they come together, they bounce off each other and, uh, and start to, the antiprotons start to catch the positrons and make the antihydrogen. The very coldest of them, we then need to catch. And so this is where Star Trek comes in. That's a picture of the device that cr creates the confinement field, we, we, which we can literally use for uh, particles that are 273 degrees below zero. We can catch them and hold them suspended in space so they don't reach matter until we decide to let them go. The interesting thing is the easiest way to detect antihydrogen is to let it go. Then we watch it explode, we characterize the explosion and say, yes, we have trapped antihydrogen. Um, and that work uh, also had a major uh, Calgary connection. In 2010, so remember this story started in, 20, in 1930, in 2010 we published our first results that we had successfully achieved storage of antihydrogen. We were really excited. As scientists go, we were popping bottles of champagne. And journalists got interested in it, because it's cool, it's Star Trek. And they said, my god, you're catching antimatter, how much did you catch? We said, 42 atoms. <laughs> well, that's not very many, how long did you hold it for? One seventh of a second. <laughs> it was cool to us, it was le much less cool to, uh, it's to everybody else. But it was a technological breakthrough. Um, by 2011, uh, we were publishing, we had, sorry, I should have, we started work in 2004, so it took us six years to get to the point where we caught the first 30 and held them for a seventh of a second. Within six months, we were holding things for 15 minutes, and we were catching hundreds of particles. And just quickly wrapping up, in 2012, we did what Barry likes to do and drive, a, we, we got our antimatter to absorb microwaves and change its quantum state. That was even more exciting. It was so exciting that we actually got the interest of the Governor General of Canada. So the Canadian group led this, exper this experiment within Alpha and we were awarded the Encirc Polanyi Prize at an awards ceremony at Widu Hall in Ottawa. So center of the front row is the Governor General. Outer edge are um, our NSERC uh, senior executives, that's the principal scientific funding agency uh, in Canada, and the rest is the, the, is the uh, crew of senior scientists. The last thing I wanted to mention um, is we were really interested in testing this question of what, what matter and antimatter do with each other. Are they interested in each other? Do they attract, each, attract or repel each other gravitationally? We've developed a technique to test this, we're about to 100 times too hot and too small to actually answer the question of what uh, antimatter um, does in, a, in, a, in the gravitational field of the Earth. The basic idea is the, anti, is the antihydrogen is our anti-apple, we want to drop it. Sounds simple, but even at very low temperature inside a trap, an atom is bouncing up and down really fast. So if you're too hot, when you let it go, it's that initial bounce, the velocity of it, that decides whether the particle goes up or down. If we can cool it down enough so that it's, it's only slowly vibrating, then when we release it, we can see the effect of gravity. We need a new apparatus for that. Um, that new apparatus is going to be called, I'm glad to say we can now say, it's going to be called Alpha G. It'll be our third generation apparatus and it will be a Canadian-led experiment the Canadian Foundation for Innovation has just announced over six million dollars of funding towards building this apparatus in CERN. So we are in the midst of uh, major development work to finalize the design for that system. 
So just uh, some concluding, concluding comments. I'm just going to skip to the end. Um, not only following Professor Salam's footprints or footsteps uh, walking across CERN every day, Alpha scientifically is. We are, um, we are a multinational effort to test the very foundations of physics, um, carrying out the work at CERN, which views him as one of the founding scientists to their work. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>